If you look at any tourist guide for Osaka, Japan, I can guarantee <laughs> that you are not going to see the recommendation of visiting nor staying in the district called Nishinari. For those of you who haven't heard of it before, it is considered to be the most dangerous area in Osaka and even one of the most dangerous areas in Japan. Now let's just get the obvious out of the way where dangerous is a very relative term <laughs> and it really means different things to different people. There is obviously no comparison of the most dangerous area in let's say New York, Chicago, Medellin, Colombia to anywhere <laughs> in Osaka, Japan. Nishinari has a very well-known red light district, uh, one that I would not attempt to uh, walk by myself in because apparently they do get quite angry if women walking by themselves go in that district. It is considered to be the area where the Japanese mafia, the Yakuza, do a lot of their business here in Osaka. But also just on a more normal level, it is the area of the city where a lot of the day laborers and people who are just down on their luck, the homeless of the city, tend to call home. And I'll tell you guys where I'm staying. It's uh, this little hotel that had really good reviews on booking.com. It's called Hotel Lucky. And I decided to stay there because you basically got your own room, though the washroom and kitchen and all that is shared, for 20 Canadian dollars a night, which is like, you know, 16 US. You, you, you can't get those kinds of prices anywhere else in Osaka, obviously. Obviously. So I'm not recommending to you guys to really stay in this area if you're looking for a nicer uh, experience of the city. But if you're really on a low budget and you're traveling by yourself because they are very small rooms, I would recommend it. Whether you choose to stay in this area or not, I think it is an interesting area to visit, especially if you've been to Japan before and you've you know seen all the beauty how perfectly clean the streets are how everything's just so organized coming to an area like this I guess kind of normalizes that this country has problems too it does have a dark underbelly so that is why I'm actually not going to be exploring this area on my own I definitely don't know enough about it in the week that I've been in Osaka and usually outside of this area to really give you guys the full scoop. So I was actually able to find a tour company for like dark tourism that gives tours of this area that takes you to spots that probably wouldn't be a great idea for obvious foreigners like myself to be going to by themselves. So I've decided to go on this tour and I will link it in the description. This obviously isn't sponsored, but I just feel like this is something different uh, to give you a perspective that goes beyond the usual, you know, stops here in Osaka, which was basically my last video. So my tour began at Daikokucho Station, which is about a 15 minute walk outside of Nishinari District. Our guide's name was Luca, and even though he wasn't born in Japan, he has lived here for a very long time and knows this area inside and out. The tour actually started in an area just outside of Nishinari District uh, called Shinsekai. This is a very popular area to go for restaurants, for bars. You'll see a lot of people hanging out in this area, especially on the weekends. So at first we really just learned about how this area came to be, how it's transformed over the years, and also about the crazy puffer fish restaurants that they have here. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but there's a special kind of puffer fish that apparently if it's not prepared right can kill you. I think it was in a Simpsons episode, but you can actually eat that here in this district. So yeah, this first part of the tour was really laid back. We got to try some street food that was included in the tour, got to try the octopus balls once again. But there was actually some really interesting areas in Shinsekai as well that I hadn't really seen before, even though I have walked around this area by myself. There was a really cool vintage arcade parlor with games from like 20, 30, 40 years ago. So if you're a fan of that sort of thing, I don't think it's something you're going to see in many other places. 
I was also very surprised to see a movie theater which streams regular movies as well as sexy movies, if you know what I mean. <laughs> But after that, we did start making our way towards Nishinari, and we happened to pass a pachinko parlor, which for those of you who don't know what pachinko is, it is more or less a very modern arcade parlor, slightly similar to our western sort of slot machines. The difference is that gambling is illegal in Japan, uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't ways to work around that. Again, we talk about Japanese standards. So still, we are in one of the safest countries in the world. As right. you, yeah. In Japan, yeah, I'm staying here. So, 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 you know, I've been living here also two years. Yeah. So, Japan, this was the first place I, I moved to. But like yeah. many foreigners do, because it's just cheaper. Yeah. And we don't mind. I mean, it's still safe for us. And, but it got this bad reputation among Japanese, among locals. And so they avoided it. So families, they might go with kids to Shinsekai, to Zakazu, on the other side of the street, and the other side of the railway. They will tell the kids never cross the street, never come, come this side. This is a very bad place and nobody want to be here. Even people from here, if they have a chance, they try to move somewhere else. If they want to kind of level up, you know. Uh, so why, why this reputation? So, well, first, as I said, working class or so very low class living here. There's no middle or high classes living here. It's just working class. Then there is the largest uh, homeless community of, of uh, in Japan. Here. They are nowadays, I mean, the, their number is not as big as it used to be, but they are, we estimate they are about four to five thousand still concentrated here in And that's another reason. Then, um, this is the very last stronghold fortress of Yakuza in Osaka. You know, Yakuza also used to be way, way stronger than now, Yakuza organization. And, and then there is the, the red light district, yeah, mm -hmm. the Tobita Shinshin. Red light district, and you know, prostitution as well is illegal in Japan nowadays. There is a loophole there too, not any bears. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there is a loophole, and I, that will be the last stop before dinner, so I will tell you more about that later. No? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's walk through. Okay, so now this is the backstory tour, so we take yeah. the back streets, you know, we don't stay in the arcade. But you saw the arcade already, you can feel a different atmosphere. It's not like nice arcades, shopping arcades in the rest of town. Um, so Nishinari was not affected by World War II. Of course, even if most of the buildings now are from after the war, they were probably built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they look like the streets, the just narrow streets and the buildings, the houses, look like the all, how the old Osaka was looking like. So they were, even the inner city was looking like this until World War II. Uh, so like these tiny houses with like two, maximum three stories and, and separated just by very narrow alleys. And you see, I'm talking about all the stuff, you can, you can find here even some parts of like stone paved streets we don't, which you don't see in any other part of the city, except castles, shrines and temples. This is a normal street, these are the entrance of the houses here. And uh, yeah, this is uh, how really, most of these houses are abandoned actually. It's a cat friendly area, so you will see many, a lot of cat food, <laughs> balls just in front of each door. And also there are many ferrets here, wild ferrets. Ferrets? Like, uh, oh. Ferrets, yes. Um, now they are hibernating still, but they are waking up this now in March, so <laughs> from next month on we'll see many of them. By the way, hidden gem. Best, honestly, one of the best okonomiyaki in Osaka. Hmm. It's a hidden gem. It's nested here in this alley, in the heart of Nishinari. Okonomiyaki Chitose. Very small place, you see, they have only three tables with three or four seats each, and four seats on the counter, and that's it. Limited hours. Open already in a few hours for lunch and dinner only. It closed very early, so now it's already closed. These are the last customers. Uh, there's always a line outside, but definitely recommended. If you want to try the authentic Okonomiyaki, uh, Osaka style Okonomiyaki experience, come to this place. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. 
in Osaka. Japanese cities used to have many tram lines, like many other cities in the Western world too. No, it's very rare to see them in just this very part is called Kamagazaki. And remember this name because this is a name that doesn't exist anymore officially. They literally erased it from all maps and from all documents. Uh, the, the government, the city government, erased this name a few decades ago. And so how the story started here? Why the homelessness are here? Uh, well, it started a long time ago, a century ago, more than a century ago. So remember before I told you to build Shin, uh, Shinsekai, the entertainment industry, they call a huge workforce from any corner of the country. And, uh, and they promised them with a house and a you know, stable job and everything. Um, well, that was basically a, a just bullshit in most of cases, lied to them. Um, so after they completed Shinsekai, they opened it to public and the zoo as well. They just fire all of them, they let, let them uh, unemployed and redundant, with no money, no, no future and nothing. And you know, they were poor people from the countryside and, and they were proud Japanese men. You think about Japanese men in Japanese culture, the men, men are the breadwinners, they need to, especially back then, now still is a little like that, but it's changing, but back then you can imagine. They are breadwinners and they are supposed to look after, provide for, not only not look after themselves, but provide for the whole family, especially, often for the extended family. Um, and if they fail to do so, they are basically, there's a big stigma on that. When they realized that, um, they felt too ashamed to go back to their families, and their hometowns, and say, oh look, I don't have a job, I don't have any savings, we don't have a new house, a new future in Osaka, we have to start again from zero, everything again. They felt too ashamed to say to do so, and so they just disappeared. They never went back home, and they disappeared. They couldn't stay there because that was the new entertainment district of Osaka, open to public. They were kicked out of there, and so they moved here. There was, as I said, there was no city here yet. There might be some scattered houses, but no more than that. Uh, so there was almost nobody around here. And so they moved here, just a few hundred meters south of Shinsekai. Then, you know, in the next decades, the group just became bigger and bigger because people from any part of life joined them. So people that were, you know, feeling uh, oppressed or feeling actually discriminated. For example, the lower members of the, min the lower classes of the minorities, Koreans and, and Chinese, they were strongly discriminated back then. Have any kind of issue or problem, they moved here. Because here they felt less pressure, less discriminated. And, and they were, for a while, they were okay, yeah, because, uh, I mean, relatively okay, because, um, you know, at that time they were not even called homelessness, they were not even considered human beings, almost. You know? But very bad treated by the police, by the authorities. And also the rest of the population was like considering them very badly. Uh, to basically to fail their life, especially men, adult men, because that was the homeless community, and it's still nowadays, only adult men. Now we found some ladies in, among them, but they, they are less than 10%. Mm -hmm. So, welcome to Tobita Shinji. This is the Red Light District. As you were asking, these mountains are still found there. Um, they are representing this kind of special stores. So, some buildings are very nice, like Taisho Heritage, so they are beautiful, especially in the night with all the lanterns and all the lights. Uh, so, that's the first thing. I say also that prostitution is illegal in Japan. It was not always like that. So, until the 50s, it was actually legal. And Red Light District were official brothers, and there was nothing wrong with that. It was legal and fair, and it's been like that for centuries. Then, in the 50s, they passed this act that immediately prohibited prostitution, even, if, even though they left some room to try to bypass the law if you want to. So, what's the loophole here? Yeah, can you guess what they're doing? As again, you cannot pay to have sexual intercourse. That, that would be against the law. So basically, what they did that night in the 50s, when they closed the place and they reopened it, what the, the legal advisor actually did on the papers is that they turned these places from actual brothels into traditional Japanese tea houses, traditional Japanese restaurants. And that's what they are still to this very day, officially. In fact, they are still brothels, and everybody knows that. They are like this, you see the lantern, the sign on the house, the lantern, this is two stories house. Uh, this open door on the street, large, you know, open door. They are all the same, like this, this is a typical establishment. Inside there, in this open space, on the ground floor, in the entrance, you will see two ladies sitting inside. One in the center, under the spotlights, and that's the waiter of the restaurant. And the other one sitting next, aside, just next to the, really next to the entrance. She's the manager of the tea house, and in fact, she is the mama-san. You talk only with the mama-san, there's no negotiation, you pay the money that you decided to, depends on the length of your tea, tea break. <laughs> and, uh, and the waiter will escort you upstairs in a private dining room. Uh, there might be one or two, depends how many waiters, uh, how many workers are in the house. Um, anyway, you have your private dining room and uh, you have your tea, a cup of tea. They might, they might give you, I don't know, a cookie or a snack, very little thing. And you have a chit-chat and you magically fall in love with the waiter and she falls in love with you. <laughs> and consensual sex between two adults is not illegal. There's nothing wrong with that. All girls here are at least 20 years old. So yeah, 
um, you are not you are not paying for that. You pay for the tea downstairs with mm-hmm. mama. No, and you pay for your dinner. And so a lot of people fall in love here every day. Obviously, I was not able to film inside of the red light district, so I'm just going to put some B-roll of some of the other parts of Nishinari that we walked around as I tell you guys about my first impressions of this area. First of all, I was shocked at how nice it was. It didn't look like a red light district at all. I think if you just walked here during the day and the windows weren't open, you would just think that they were restaurants. (laughs) It wasn't at all like Kabukicho in Tokyo where it's kind of seedy and you can obviously tell what's going on behind closed doors. These places truly looked like high-end restaurants. The girls, I will say, were absolutely beautiful. Some actually kind of waved at us and seemed really nice. Though I will say the Mama-sans were not happy. Like, they were not happy that we were in their district and some of us even kind of waved us away. So I think that's kind of what the locals were telling me before, where especially if you're a female walking around in this area, they kind of don't want you there. Also keep in mind that for a very long time, foreign men were not welcome in this area either. It was specifically just for Japanese men. I guess times have changed and some are accepting of foreign customers, but it is still primarily uh, for local men. Now I'm obviously in no way endorsing this sort of industry, but I just wanted to give you guys some insight about what this area is about. And if you did happen to do this tour, this is what you can expect. All in all, I would recommend it. I had a really good time on the tour. I'll link it in the description as I mentioned, but I hope you guys enjoyed this video and it gave you some insight into topics that maybe aren't as common on your regular sort of tours of Japan in general because on the surface and especially for first-time visitors it really does look like a perfect place where most people have a really high quality of life there's not the safety issues that we have abroad and while those statements are overall true they do of course still have their own set of problems and I just wanted to highlight a unique (laughs) district in Osaka that I think will actually uh, gain recognition over time because there are more uh, foreign visitors that are coming to this area so if you happen to be in Osaka go check it out. As always, I'm sending you guys so much love. I hope you're having a fantastic day. And the next video that you will see from me is Super Cute Deer from Nara. So stay tuned and keep being your own kind of beautiful. Bye, guys.